The Intellectual Gentleman's Club. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. I'm your host, Jason Abbott. This is a bonus episode, and it gives you a peek into the Michigan Psychedelic Society. Usually it's just a group discussion with uh, local people that meet up and just talk about various things psychedelic, but we wanted to do something a little bit different for the holidays, so we asked James W. Gesso to stop on by and give a presentation thought it turned out pretty well. It was very informative, and I think James is a very well-spoken guy. Had him on the podcast before, actually, just about a year ago. I wanted to give a big thanks to James for sharing his time with us and dropping his knowledge. I encourage you to take a look at all his projects. His main hub is jameswgesso.com. You can find links to his books, his articles, his podcast, Adventures Through the Mind, all very informative stuff. Sorry about the audio quality with uh, some of the questions and answers section of the presentation. I did a lot of testing, and uh, by the time I set up remotely, uh, just a couple things had changed, and it picked up my computer mic instead of the uh, mic through the mixer. So apologies on that. Hopefully you can uh, just get through those questions near the end. If you want a little bit more information about the Michigan Psychedelic Society, you can head on over to Facebook and just do a quick search. That's where our main hub is for that. And for the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club, it is intellectualgentlemensclub.com. That's where you can find all of our previous podcasts and support links and all that good stuff. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'd rather have James do the talking for you this afternoon. I appreciate you tuning in, and hopefully you can check out our archives for our previous episode and guests. And without further ado, I give you James W. Gesso. Okay, so you got a pretty good view, everybody. Uh, this is the Michigan Psychedelic Society for today. Uh, we have varying members, and uh, usually our groups are centered on just talking amongst ourselves about different psychedelic experiences and different spiritual uses, recreational uses, and such. Um, James, we spoke almost a year ago to the day I was looking at Skype, and um, we talked a lot about your books, and I am hoping you can talk a little bit about uh, psilocybin today and some of the experiences you've had and the integration work you've done and whatnot. I know you cover a wide variety of different things, so the floor is yours. I've given you a brief introduction about your books. Um, uh, the website is jameswgesso.com. Adventures Through the Mind podcast, uh, that's a really good one too. Uh, uh, so I give the floor to you. Welcome. Hey. Hi everyone. How's my sound quality? You hear me alright? I'm using my podcasting mic. Hmm? Rather than just like my little laptop on my couch or something. Which normally I like to do those kinds of things there. Uh, yeah, so I don't know what, is, is anyone familiar with, with me and what I've been doing before having come to this event and giving an introduction from Jason? It is a little bit of that, but I don't think maybe many of the members are very familiar with the work. You want to maybe give a brief overview? And... Sure. Um, Jason, can you mute your audio, um, please? How's that? Uh, like, no, like, mute your mic. Yeah, it's muted. Oh, no, it shouldn't be, because I can still hear you. Really? Yeah. Okay. Or it should be, but it isn't. Just because I'm getting a lot of feedback, and I can hear myself, so it'd be very difficult to okay. talk with you guys in that context. Fantastic. Great. Um, okay, so... Sorry, guys. Interestingly enough, although we haven't even started, this is going so much better. 
than the last time I Skyped in uh, for a webinar kind of lecture thing, um, which was a couple years ago, actually, and it was for the, oh, what's it called, uh, Samara, it's like a conference, a psychedelics conference out in Australia, and I, at that time, was, we'll say, knee-deep in post-traumatic stress disorder and was having anxiety, I didn't even know really what was happening, I was having extreme anxiety, and uh, I had my second ever full-blown panic attack like 20 minutes before I started that lecture, and unfortunately it went terrible um, because I tried to pretend like I was totally calm and present and I was like, you know, I tried to pretend like I was an authority on a subject rather than just showing up as, you know, an authority on the subject, which was my own experiences, and it didn't, it didn't go very well, unfortunately. So hopefully lack of panic attack will help this one go much better. Um, I have a bunch of notes here. I almost definitely will not use them, but I might. Uh, okay, so you don't really know much about me at all. Uh, I run a podcast. I used to think of myself primarily as a writer, and then more and more so I realize I think I'm becoming a bit of a journalist for psychedelic culture uh, with my podcast, Adventure Through the Mind, and I have written three books, uh, which gave me the inclination that I was a writer, which I still think I am at heart. Decomposing the Shadow was mentioned to you. Um, and then The True Light of Darkness and Soundscapes and Psychedelics. So the Decomposing the Shadow was what I presented as a, a model or a conceptual model for engaging the psilocybin experience, which is to say that the psilocybin and, mar and mushrooms and how they... Uh, sort of manifest in our inner subjective experience in a way that leads towards um, increased self-awareness, increased, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use some language that's newer that I've been earning over my increased research and experiences, uh, but self-awareness, increased response flexibility, um, increased presence, which is to say like present to what's authentically happening now in the moment um, between you and another person or between you and the world around you, rather than um, being stuck in the past due to emotional repression. Also, the alleviation of emotional repression through a type of uh, through through a type of catharsis that um, unfolds inside if things go optimally inside of a um, of a secure connection with something greater than ourselves, which is the the sense or essence of magic and mystery, um, or even God or or, or mystical or or, or whatever it might be, um, that emerges through the active choice of surrender on our part in the midst of this type of catharsis, which in the book I call Facing the Shadow, um, or Decomposing the Shadow. Uh, and I presented a model for that, and I presented that model in the, in the sense that what we experience um, and how we experience what we experience and how we come to understand those things is based primarily in our language. And our language isn't just the words that we use, but it's the very underlying biases for reality that are uh, embedded, we'll say, um, that gestate inside of our language and give birth to our experience of the world. And I felt like the language around psilocybin for the modern people here in dominant North America, uh, for at least what I had and what I had been exposed to as a member of the psychedelic subculture, was thoroughly lacking in viewing the mushrooms for these uh, potentially life-affirming, life-giving, positive, um, therapeutic, spiritual encounters. I got a lot of language that was either, you know, a hodgepodge scrapbook of, of just dis descriptions of the aesthetic or uh, resting inside of a... Uh, culture of purely recreational use or um, languages that emerge out of the culture of, um, of sort of the, the biomedical model, like uh, the research culture, the medicalizing of psychedelics culture, which is just one small fraction, I think, of the potential of, uh, of psilocybin and psychedelics in general. And then I also have the model of the conventional world, the language of just say no to drugs, and I'm sure you y'all down there and I'm, I'm not mocking when I say y'all it is the best way of saying you in the plural sense uh, down there in America 
definitely know wholly and completely to the core of your being what to just say no is all about uh, as much as I have up here in Canada. But um, yeah, so the, none of those models really gave me a sense of what was happening to me and why it was I was getting better um, when I was tripping with the mushrooms. So I, I developed this book as a way of offering that cultural model, that new language which I, I personally believe that we here in, well, I said this room, I'm in a different room, but like in this shared experience right now and in the community that you're participating in locally and we're participating in um, on the broader scale is the, you know, engineering sounds sort of like clandestine, but the engineering or the cultivation of a new cultural model to replace the, the, the shallow, um, the shallow cultural heritage that most of us have growing up in dominant North America and that um, encountering the psilocybin and sharing in these communities, building new language, what we're doing is we're building culture and we're building culture in a way that it can be our friend up uh, to sort of like reference Terence McKenna. Um, and and that, that was something that I, I felt like I was doing with that book in a, these are, these are my thoughts on this. And then I did The True Light of Darkness, which is sort of the other side of that book, which instead of these are my thoughts on the matter, it's like here are my experiences, um, primarily in going in and doing the shadow decomposition work, which is the uncomfortable stuff. And then Soundscapes and Psychedelics, uh, that was just me being really heady and trying to like engage a postmodernist view on, on reality from a very psychedelic informed perspective, um, which I still stand by, which we could talk about in questions afterwards if you like. Um, also, I respond best to questions, so if, you, if you've got them brooding up, definitely hold on to them for when it's time to go in a little bit deeper. So inside of Decomposing the Shadow and continuously in my work, I have been working on re, uh, refining this language so that I could sort of plant it like a seed inside of culture and see, like, does it, does it germinate? Does it blossom? Does it blossom for other people? And so far it has been blossomed well, which is nice. Um, and some of the things that I, uh, some of these models, these seeds that I've presented are things like, um, the four archetypes of psilocybin, uh, which are qualities that emerge inside of the, inside of a specific scenario or intention for working with psilocybin, uh, which is the, um, surrender, uh, facing the shadow, uncovering the true self and oneness, which is surrender is like the primary pattern of experience. None of these are independent other than in discourse. Um, they intermingle and dance seamlessly throughout the experience in a way that seems, um, I personally seem as very elegant. Uh, but surrender is one of the first and primary ones, which is to quote Dennis McKenna, who I just interviewed for my podcast yesterday. Um, it's sort of based in the, in the ongoing lesson of like, you don't know shit. So just like pay attention, you know, just give in and pay attention. And, I definitely believe that this is a powerful lesson that we can learn from uh, psilocybin and a very valuable one to the ongoing development of our lives due to dominant North America's um, thoroughly unhealthy obsession with competence and mastery, um, even when humility is the most appropriate uh, cause and play in, 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 in any particular moment. Um, so surrender felt very important and also without surrender we risk um, generating anxiety by resisting what's happening, resisting the flow of the mushroom intelligence and uh, you know contributing to what we might call as a bad trip which could be a thread that we could pick up later in the Q&A but I do believe in bad trips I actually have a very complex uh, framework for that and I'd love to share that with you guys afterwards if you like um, but so surrender is a very important part of getting the healing process uh, with psilocybin. Now this healing process goes into into this whole facing the shadow thing. So the shadow is everything about ourselves that we choose not to look at or we've had chosen for us 
not to look at or we're being influenced to not even recognize as being present. So this might include our, you know, shitty behaviors. It might include certain emotions that have been or feelings that have been sort of culturally demonized or minimized or told that, you know, are just like not okay in society, uh, such as, you know, like it's okay to feel grief, but not too much grief. Don't cry too loud or sadness because sadness could, you know, if you're sad, maybe you're depressed. If you're depressed, you're sick. Oh my God, are you sick? Or uh, anger, you know, like of course, anger now gets a really bad rap because of, I think, a lot of psychologically unhealthy people um, expressing anger in a way that is very damaging on the self and on other people. And anger is sort of cultural association with aggression and violence, which is not inherent. That's, that's a cultural thing. Um, but we're told that certain emotions are okay to feel, they're not okay to express, they're not okay to share, lest we, you know, suffer from uh, the shame, the judgment, and the guilting of, um, of the people around us, which is how we, as a society, manipulate each other's behaviors as becoming agents of the larger cultural um, program, <laughs> whatever that might be, uh, utilizing shame and guilt to modify our behaviors and keep us in line. So the shadow might include these feelings that we're not supposed to feel. They might also include feelings that we felt that were so bad, that were so painful that um, we weren't able to look at them and we never, and this is an extension towards trauma, we weren't able to go back and discharge those emotions, we weren't able to learn from them, we weren't able to feel held in secure connection and empathetic witness, typically from our caregivers uh, or from members of our community, and so we didn't finish those emotions or discharge them, so we structured this identity around those adaptations which prevent us from truly knowing who we are because we begin to identify with these adaptations rather than identifying with our authenticity. This is also a thread we can pick up later. Um, so the facing the shadow is maybe having to see all of those things. And, um, and that can be extremely uncomfortable. And if it starts to become uncomfortable and this becomes... Um, this becomes a part of one's experience, and the first lesson, the first archetype is engaged, the, uh, the surrender, then uh, it can create anxiety, a lot of anxiety, and the trip itself can create more harm, vastly more harm than good. Uh, thankfully, mushrooms are, are, are easy to dose, so if you haven't taken too much, that, that encounter might not be as you know, terrible on your psyche as, say, if you had a bad encounter with ayahuasca or something. Um, but it can still create trauma in and of itself. So surrender to facing the shadow. Now what happens when we face the shadow is we get into the archetype, the uncovering of the true self. Now, first off, the true self isn't a static thing. It's sort of like a, it's like a numinous center. It's a, it's a numinous center. It's an expression of our authentic self manifest in the present experience as an extension of our past and our future. And that is to say, it's what we're feeling right now. Uh, we feel and we perceive, and then from the perceptions we become into interpretations, and then the interpretations become behavior. And uncovering the truth self means going into those feelings. And this is, this is a layered one as well, because what might be your true self is exactly how you feel right now that you never chose to acknowledge because you were never able to acknowledge it because you never felt safe to acknowledge how deeply sad you are because of this lifestyle you've gotten yourself into, which you only got yourself into because it's the cultural heritage that was, you know, bequeathed onto you in a traumatized, dysfunctional society and parents that are directly affected by that creating, you know, early life emotional conditions and social conditions that contribute to making choices that are disconnected from what truly nourishes your heart, your soul, and your spirit. So the true self might be a facing of how that all feels. And it can also be an uncovering of who we are if none of those things existed, if, if we never traded our authenticity for an attachment to maintain a sense of safety in our familial dyna dynamics early in life, then who would we be? Who would we be if we were just allowed to be ourselves? And I know this, it sounds very simple, but it's just viciously impossible. Not impossible, so that's my own biases here, but it's, it's viciously difficult um, to just be ourselves. 
uh, surprisingly. And so uncovering the true self might include that, and it might include what um, what is the third archetype, which is oneness. And so oneness is the sense of being either connected with something greater than ourselves. It could be an, a, an identification beyond our personality, beyond the um, our, our individuated consciousness. So I could feel like I'm connected to the force. This is an expression of oneness. If we're in a group, I could feel like I'm really connected. Like the boundaries of who I normally believe myself to be dissolve enough so to include the the inner emotional richness of those I am with or that in which I am immersed in, be it nature or be it some sort of larger cosmic force, call it God, universe, source, whatever. And this is an expression of oneness as well. And to some degree, I believe that this is also an uncovering of the true self or what um, one of my primary teachers, Gabor Mate, calls the essential self. So these are the four archetypes uh, of psilocybin, and they're, in my mind, they're all part and parcel to the to the dance, um, to the play of being that emerges when we encounter and choose to encounter psilocybin within the specific context of healing and what I call psycho spiritual maturation, which includes the development of um, of self awareness, and it includes the uh, the releasing of past emotional repression it includes the realigning of our of our nervous system physiologically from an ongoing preparedness for th- uh, threat response due to an unprocessed traumatic event from the past um, and it also includes a sense of compassion it, it's basically when you think about when you think about in your mind what is an elder and I don't just mean the word that we give to people who are older than us, because I believe that, of course, it's important to honor and to respect our elders, but I also believe that due to the context of dominant North American society, the nuclear family, and the prioritization of youth, uh, which is almost like this strange sexual obsession with like young bodies, young minds, young mentality, uh, that we have more olders than we have elders. So... When you think elder, maybe think about it from a, the way a First Nations person would say elder, or the way somebody who somebody who's profoundly wise, profoundly experienced. They're not bittered by the way things have been. They're not bittered by the way things are. They are empowered by it in this supple, humble, beautiful, fragile way. That is psycho-spiritual maturation, and we're all going to go through that. In fact, um, chances are most grandparents are more spiritually, psycho-spiritually mature than most spiritual teachers that you will meet who are around your age. But I believe that we can sort of, um, we can, we can uh, strengthen the process. We can encourage the process by building a, a relationship of trust and by building a friendship or an allyship or a teacher-student relationship with the mushroom, in particular the aspects of our own inherent wisdom as they manifest subjectively in the midst of our encounters with the, uh, we'll say, myconutritional profile of this intelligent organism, the psilocybin mushroom. And uh, so... Yeah, psycho-spiritual maturation, I think, is something that uh, our culture deeply needs because we have a culture, I think, that um, celebrates and prioritizes extremely juvenile perspectives and behaviors, um, which doesn't really serve any of us. And um, I also think that with psycho-spiritual maturity comes compassion. And in a culture of extreme political, um, we'll say, disparity, and especially in North America, I think it's exceptionally worse in um, in the United States than it here is in Canada. I'm sorry about that. I'm also happy that it's not as bad here yet, but there's no guarantee that we won't go that way like the rest of the world seems to be going. Um, that there's a lack of compassion there, there's a lack of understanding, which I think comes from inherently traumatic um, 
disposition of, of modern society in dominant North America. So with that compassion, we're able to we're able to really listen to others. We're able to really be there. We're really able to understand where our shit ends and where another person's shit begins. And hopefully we can hold space for others to do that as well. One of the greatest mistakes, I think, of the sort of common era insofar as spirituality is this extension of the (laughs) juvenile which is to say ecocentric um, nature of dominant North America, which is that it's about me and that our, you know, it's about my spirituality, my spiritual practice, my spiritual process, my spiritual awakening. We're building communities so that my spirituality can be more expressed, you know, and this gives rise to spiritual bypassing and spiritual materialism um, in and outside of the psychedelic community. But it's really something greater than ourselves. We, each of us here, are participating in a larger spiritual project. And that doesn't come with any metaphysical claim about, um, you know, our spiritual practice dissolving blockages or, or healing the planet or anything like that. Although I, depending on my pessimism that day, do have a tendency to believe that. Uh, it's, it's to say that we're participating in a movement of human consciousness within society. And I believe that that is the building of new culture, the building of, or an evolution of culture off the, uh, the shoulders of the giants that came before us in environments such as this one and in the larger discourse around psychedelics. Though not inherently, I don't believe they're benevolent. Um, I definitely believe that like, again, I'll quote Dennis because I just spoke with him yesterday, that it's our relationship to plants, whether they're good or bad. But uh, I do believe that the current context of how shitty everything is right now around the world is really calling us to a place of um, needing to have wisdom and psychospiritual maturity, which includes compassion. Um, and all of that, in order to get there, we need to do our own work. We need to be able to differentiate between what's our shit and what's another person's shit, what's actually really happening right now, and what is just a, um, a, a misinterpretation of what's actually happening due to a disconnection from the present moment, due to an ongoing carrying of unresolved emotions and pain from our past, coloring our present through the influence of um, of that pain logged into implicit memory showing up in the present moment, not realizing it's a memory. So I think that psilocybin can help us do that, but it can only help us do that if we have an understanding that it can. And I mean that in the sense of like, not just an understanding conceptually, but an understanding socially, because um, I believe that, and I'm kind of just going off, so I hope you're picking up any threads that I'm dropping here. Um, but I believe that the true land, uh, like landing pad, the true mark of integration with a psilocybin practice or relationship is community and how we're seen in our community. We are relational beings. The fact that at times we think we're alone <laughs> and then we think that we're isolated and we think that we're just like, these like flesh islands wandering adrift amongst other flesh islands, never making true contact, um, never really feeling held and seen, is an unfortunate result of A, a traumatic society, which is to say that trauma is a disconnection from the self and a disconnection from the present moment, um, but also from the evolution of being disconnected with our connection to the essential self, which is the point in me, the point in you that connects um, with all that is all at once, which I believe is a very long, convoluted, and um, messy history extending as far back as, uh, well, as far back as the dawn of the first sort of empire and the first movements of what we now know as colonialism, as all descendants in modern colonialism and modern empire. Um, but through into the, the disconnection of direct mystical encounter in the ancient Israelites, 
uh, all the way up to priest class and the Catholic Church, and then the fall and the desacralizing, desacralizing of life through the Renaissance into the complete disruption of a very sense of being and meaning at all due to you know, post-modernist deconstruction. Um, I kind of like went on a trip there, forgot where I was going, but yeah, we're in, we're in some trouble. We're in some trouble. And, um, coming to, oh yes, so we are relational beings. Our psychological, our spiritual, our physical, our, all that health is based in our social connections. And, the one one of the things that really blocks our capacity to have healthy connections is not knowing who we are and we won't know who we are if we have repressed or buried away the honesty of how we feel due to uh, poor conditioning culturally and familially over time um, and psilocybin can help us do that psychedelics can help us do that in the right context so um, yeah, what's next? That goes into uh, what I believe to be the three gifts from psilocybin, which is courage, freedom, and presence. The courage is that if you've ever, if you've taken it once, if, if you've ever had an uncomfortable experience once, it takes a whole hell of a lot of courage to take mushrooms again. Even if you've just had only one. If you've never had it and you've only had like social construction around, around what mushrooms are all about, it takes courage to have it once, but it takes a hell of a lot more courage to do it again after it's gotten thoroughly uncomfortable. And I think that the courage to say, and, and this is an extension of the larger cultural model that I was, I'm seeding here and I'm sure a lot of you are seeding in your own ways and cultivating in your own ways in your community there. Um, which is to say, like, I have the courage to see the truth. And I think if we know how to listen, the mushrooms will tell us the truth. They'll show us the truth, and it's not always comfortable. Um, and so it takes courage to know the truth. Also, I think that if we have the courage to go, well, last time I took mushrooms, I completely relived, um, I completely relived the abandonment when my mother left me as a child, and I was reduced to a sobbing baby, um, you know, praying for help and, um, and having gotten that help, you know. But if the last time you went through that, that is what you went through. And you came out the other end of it feeling like that was good, like you let some stuff go, like you learned some stuff. Like you were able to go through an important therapeutic process of catharsis and releasing trauma in presence to the actual feelings that are there, discharging them with the sense of secure connection with a mystical force that is beyond yourself, all loving, all knowing and wise, which mushrooms can access. Then, you know, getting involved in a new relationship might not be as scary as it once was. Going to a new job might not be as scary as it once was because the courage to face the mushroom experience, goddammit, that is a courage that is so much greater than the petty little things that we get worried about in our lives often. Uh, not to say that they're petty, that they're not meaningful, that you're challenged by them, but if we are really in connection with our courage, we would realize that oftentimes the monster in the closet is actually just a crying, scared um, little child. So that's the courage and the present is a part of being present with what is, which is not always comfortable. And it's not always a good feeling. And sometimes it is comfortable. Sometimes it's like really exciting, but then because it's so exciting, we get afraid of it, such as falling in love, for example. And we can cultivate, uh, if we can have the courage to be with how we feel, then it gives us a capacity for presence. If we know where our shit ends and another person's shit begins, we're more capable of being present when their shit comes up, and we're also more capable of being able to know when our boundaries need to be appropriately set to protect ourselves from their shit become, like getting splattered all over us and making a mess of our lives. Um, and so there's a presence in that. And if you have the courage to be present with what is, then that gives you a hell of a lot of freedom. Because it gives you the freedom to choose how you interpret the world. It gives you the freedom to say, you know what? Instead of running away from this experience, instead of pretending like this experience isn't meaningful, even though to my deep core self that it is, instead of um, missing out on things that otherwise would be very nourishing, 
um, because I'm afraid to be with the experience of maybe succeeding, maybe failing, um, good feelings, not so good feelings, because of the fear of that I run away from it. But if I have the courage to be present to it, well, then I have the capacity to choose. I have the freedom to choose. Response flexibility is a term that I learned recently that I really like. I get the courage to no longer be the puppet of what I was told and taught and conditioned to be, see, and do, and act. But instead, I get an opportunity to choose. And I believe that psychospiritual maturation, with or without mushroom practice, the cultivation of that is the cultivation of an increased bandwidth or capacity for response flexibility. So all of these things and everything that I've told you is a part of me hoping to, and like my, my stuff with my podcast and the books and stuff is, is me trying to figure out what the hell I've gone through in a lot of ways. And I, I see myself not too dissimilar than most people alive in this world, especially the, like I can only see Caucasian people in the video. I don't know if there are people of color in the room, but I can only see Caucasian people. If you're Caucasian and you live in North America, you are the, you are, your lineage is that of having your cultures destroyed at some point by the movement of the British and then the American Empire. You do not live where your ancestors' bones are laid. You might not even know where those ancestors are. You might not have any sense of cultural heritage whatsoever. You are culturally an orphan, which is very disenfranchising, especially when you realize that the cultural heritage that we're given in dominant North America, part of me, is fucking disgusting. And it is the reason we're in the, the shit pile that we're in right now. And, and so for me, I recognize this. And I believe that early on, I reached the psychedelics to give me a sense of meaning and connection with something that was so much more profound. But in the process, just kept showing me how, <laughs> how distorted things are. And so this is a part of my process as well. I don't consider myself necessarily an expert here, but someone who's been thinking about it a lot and somebody who hopefully has a capacity to share those ideas in ways that gets other people thinking about them as well. Yeah. Also, I had a coffee nap just before this, so I like went to, I like took some high dose of caffeine and then went to sleep with some nootropics and woke up, so I'm like super on. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm speaking too fast, but I feel like I might be. Um, all right, so that was my that was my shtick, my spiel. I'd be really interested in getting your questions and getting an idea of what out of that you'd like me to expand on, or what hit you meaningfully and you'd like you know to bring into discussion amongst the group. interested in exploring the, the possibility that those two things aren't truly distinct. Because it seems to me that the only reason you can Wait, wait, can, can you, sorry, can you pause for a second? Um, Jason, try not to move the camera around because it, it made it so I, I couldn't, I couldn't hear uh, this man here. Uh, and I really want to hear your question. So, these things being distinct, it seems like the only reason why we would need this erective boundary at any point would be because of our habit of identifying these shit. So, like, if we really are fully occupying the perspective that we are entirely relational beings and that independence is of each one of us is entirely illusory, then it doesn't seem like there is a distinction between where, like, there isn't a place where my shit ends and someone else's shit begins. I mean, there's a place where 
the conditioning that I bring to the table sort of like, you know, there's a realm of it that is under my purview or like I have more control over it. Whereas there's the, the other persons and then there's the place where they connect. But if I'm like, <clears throat> say if I'm skilled at hosting their shit, why, like, why, why do we need this? Why do we need this concept of boundary at all? Like, I understand that it's very helpful in, in conventional reality, in conventional relationships. Like, but is it really, like, does this really express the, the truth of the matter? So, I think that's a great question and some great comments there. Um, Jason, can you mute the mic as soon as, I think you may, maybe did. Um, so, okay, perhaps, yes, I actually believe that, that we are so interconnected that if we were to try to isolate exactly where the self is, we wouldn't be able to find it. It's like trying to find the, the fundamental particle of existence. <laughs> you know, like we just keep finding more interrelational, um, particle, um, dynamics. But also at the same time, um, there's no avoiding the, the reality in a social modern in a social world that I still have what is I perceive as my hopes and my dreams and what nourishes me and what hurts me and what doesn't hurt me. Um, I still have my sense of self, which is a beautiful gift of being human, this self-reflexive I am experience. And so the importance of being able to set boundaries is that, I mean, perhaps in a in a very intimate, trusting relationship, you can let those boundaries down. You could trust another person to know you greater than you know yourself. I mean, truly, every time we make love, we let those boundaries down, right? We become, we create, I mean, depending on how deep we go, but like we create this experience of being one, you know, body, one moving being. We're just like one expression, a process of coitus over time, frozen in the present moment of now for an eternity, you know, but so that's possible. But at the same time, we need boundaries because it's functional. If I, if I, if I didn't have boundaries, then what would stop me from recognizing like, oh, okay, perhaps it's spiritually meaningful on some level to be like, I am not it. I am not a self. I am, you know, like whatever. And so people just can come in. They can take my things. They can eat my food. You know, I, I, I don't differentiate my opinions from, you know, the opinions of others. I walk around. I mean, there are some people in this room who might um, claim or experience that they're so empathetic that they just suffer walking down the street, walk, feeling the suffering from other people. I mean, like, that's beautiful on a spiritual level, but it's thoroughly emotionally dysfunctional if you're trying to, like, focus on your, like, your life path, which might not include holding on to and being, like, you know, um, held down by other people's stuff. And I also believe that if we are to achieve um, really beautiful things in this life, now, I... I, it's, I find it sometimes hard to differentiate and like use language that doesn't, that isn't sourced in, in worth defined by doing and productivity because it's just so embedded in, in language or in, in the language that I know. But I think if we are to really truly fully and beautifully um, express the greatest expression of our purpose on this planet, which may very well simply just being ourselves, we need to have a sense of self and we need to have communities that nourish and support each other in that way. And so the sort of larger philosophical understanding of our interconnectivity is very important. But then the, the, the pragmatism of a sense of self, a sense of purpose, a sense of, um, of, of uniqueness, because even though you know, none of us are in individuals. Each one of us is thoroughly unique, a unique expression of all the things that everyone else has too, but, you know, unique in a way as well. Um, and I also think that this, this makes room for, um, for, this makes room for culture. It makes room for different cultures and being able to celebrate diversity rather than, um, the cultivation of an ongoing homogeny 
um, parading and pretending itself as multiculturalism. So, yeah, those d- does that kind of like expand on your question? There was like a lot to unpack there, but I don't want to leave anything untold if you feel like that didn't meet your question. I think it's, it's fascinating, right? It is an amazing question, right? Like, to what extent are boundaries important when we when we can occupy that perspective that they're on some like in some you know profound way illusory. But the way I see it is less that we need boundaries and more that we need the like. We need behaviors and ways of being that recognize sort of different scoping levels of intimacy. So it's like I can be, like, I, it's like on some level I have to be, to be functional in the world, I must be open to the way that everyone is because there's no, I have no option. If, like, if, right, I'm not open to the way that Donald Trump or the like the movement of people who support him. If I'm not if on some level open to that, then I'm going to be consumed by frustration. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just a non functional way of being. So but it's not like I should be intimate with that. And so, also I, yeah. there's a degree of boundary there I want to comment on because you could be open to Donald Trump's existence. And have compassion for the fact that he's a deeply, deeply troubled man. And the only reason he's acting the way that he is is because he's just like riddled with generations of vicious trauma um, and somehow managed to find his way into political office. But you could recognize that. But if you don't have boundaries, then what's going to stop him from entering his immigration ban? Like if, if, if there were no boundaries then he would just be, I mean, he's already running, running a fucking muck, but it would be like even worse, you know, like, so there's the, the is essence that, of really, needing to, oh, sorry, the mic's off, so I couldn't hear you. Is that really a boundary? It is a boundary. It's saying, whoa, 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 at this point, you are now intruding on my sense of self. You're intruding on my sense of safety. You're, you're intruding into the space that I am working very hard to create intimate connections with where I can feel like an expression of myself. So it would be like, you know, I know this is like such a played out metaphor, but like him, like just coming into your house and eating your food. And it's like, Hey man, you know, like I don't want you to do that. I don't have much money. I work really hard for this food. I don't even have much left. I'm hungry. You know, you got lots of food and lots of money. You're just taking mine. What the hell? So like we, the boundary is to protect that. And I think it's actually beautiful. I think boundaries set us free because if we know what's too far and what isn't, then we are able to engage in dynamic movement complexity. If I'm in just a void space, then there is no up and no down and no left and no right. How can I dance and make poetic movement um, if I have no dimensional existence? But if I know where the walls are, then I can do that. And I believe somewhat paradoxically understanding our interconnectivity and the illusion of selfhood is what enables us to really embrace and love and explore that unique illusion of selfhood in a way that we only get to do now as humans. Is that... It's, it's just interesting. Like, these are just two different ways of thinking and describing about, like, describing things. I'm actually, like, uh, I have a long time spent as a competitive debater, and I now coach competitive debate, and mm-hmm. it's a whole bunch of arguing about, uh, about, you know, should we have immigration policy or shouldn't we? And really the way I come to see it See it actually is that there's it's not a question of boundaries but of distinction. That it's not that there's like this realm that of like things that <clears throat> well it's really it's really like that 
Yeah, it's not like there's this boundary of things that are just like, this is just not who I am, or this is not, who's like, this is not, this is separate in some way. This is, it's not that, it's not that what Donald Trump does, and what I, like, propose doing, or what, you know, like, the people who I work with, and work alongside with, propose doing, like, it's not like those things are, like, somehow separate. What it is, is it's like the world is a sea of forces and a sea of different actions. And some actions, it's like the things that you're, you're talking about putting boundaries up against, it's like, um, because of, like, because of my, like, the, from the place from which I occupy, I have, you know, a perspective that has been filled with love for people and for the nature and for for so many of the things that you're talking about developing and cultivating and diversifying. And that that and love is, is like connectedness. And so because mm-hmm. I'm so filled with connection to these things mm-hmm. and I can distinguish between a kind of action which supports those things and a kind of action which destroys those things, because of my connection itself, I seek through action to divert, divert power and divert energy and divert existence away from the, from supporting and nourishing the kinds of actions that are like, That sounds like a really uh, elegant and distinct nuance for describing something very similar to what I'm describing pragmatically as, as boundaries. And I think that this, um, this, uh, this sort of like state of, of social being that you're describing is gorgeous and i would love to experience something like that and i also know that it's not possible to experience that in our modern world outside of isolated communities of trust and so at some point um yeah i i think i think that if you and i were to engage in a lot in a larger discussion i think we'd really come to some interesting sort of places where we overlap in that i think there's uh, some cool language stuff that i could definitely get on board with um, so I thank you for sharing it. I also want to be mindful of um, other people who might want to also ask questions. So thank you for that really engaging and um, intelligent uh, presentation of ideas and questions. Yeah, and try to like sit right in front of the camera because then I can I can see you. Hi. Um, so, um, my main question is this, in what ways do you find it most effective to reach uh, with psychedelics a deeper sense of understanding um, in regards of, uh, you know, the uniqueness that it brings, being able to step back and see, like, the overview or the master webbing of how things inter interrelate with each other, interconnect with each other. Um, your thoughts on how to, I guess, reach better questions to uh, find deeper understanding in whatever it is you're seeking. Uh, can you turn off the mic, please? Thank you. Yeah, so... Read more psychology books. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I think it's sort of like it's a little bit of a dance, right? It's a little bit of a dance. I think the the deeper we get into into an understanding of who we are, the further along we go in our journey of, of understanding and wisdom, the more interesting the questions can become. I mean, there's the formulating of questions, which means there's some level of uh, self awareness practice that's happening. Just general seated meditation is a great one but there's all sorts of different forms of it um, that can contribute to sort of asking more um, personally relevant questions because you have a deeper sense of who you are like of, of your personhood uh, insofar as creating spaces to explore that i think the primary one is creating a safe space uh, in the sense that it's like psychologically physically socially you're safe to be with what's happening without having to resist, without having to feel like um, your fears are legitimate, because like the fears might come up, but they actually might be the they might be the stuff 
that you're their experience you know it's like um yeah it's like what you what you're experiencing the fear is what you came here to experience it's not like the fear is blocking you but if you're in an unsafe environment then you might miss out on answering those deeper questions or exploring those deeper questions maybe not necessarily getting an answer because you're too worried about you know like is the door locked or is somebody going to find me or is this person going to freak out or can I cry in front of that person or oh my god I'm all alone what if something happens like, so creating a safe environment I think is 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 really important as well um, also I think community again like I'm, I'm a huge proponent of community and I, I think in a way it's because I, I have the I have the inner sense that I lack um, a lot of the time I lack the type of spiritual and intellectual community that are on vibe with what I'm exploring directly and locally um, in a way that's feels very sad for me um, a lot of the time very lonely uh, but I believe in this in the cultivation of this community because you can really tease out some ideas what you're thinking about is usually sounds a lot different um, than what you're talking about with another person it's like as soon as you have to make words out of it and get somebody else's feedback there's like this this mirroring effect this is sort of like what this other gentleman here was talking about and like um, you know like there is like we're just like reflections of each other. I know that's not necessarily the words. I'm sorry if I'm badly characterizing your statement there, but um, we're like reflections of each other, and we can be great mirrors to, for feedback and stuff. So I think, um, yeah, I think. So what did I say? Sort of more reading, um, more cultivation of self awareness, uh, the creation of a safe space with ceremonial or sacred intent, uh, maybe not necessarily sacred if you don't want to put that sort of religious vibe into it, um, and a community to explore those ideas with, not only um, in you know incubation, idea incubation phase, but then also the integration phase as well. Um, but we could do that with writing, with online communities, with journaling, with artwork as well. So if you don't have an immediate community, which I see that you have some semblance of immediate community there, um, it's possible to do it without other people right there. I can see you. Does that kind of answer your question? Did I? Yes. Thumb? Yes, that was a yes. Okay, great. Thumbs up, right on. Okay, um, any other questions? Hello. I was wondering uh, what type of ceremonies do you like to do when you take mushrooms or to promote awareness? Mm, okay, so great question. Um, the short answer is I do the ceremony that feels most personally meaningful um, and relevant to the context in which I'm using the mushrooms. Uh, so that's the, that's the short answer. For example, if I'm going into an ayahuasca experience, which is, um, can be equally, like those are equally as powerful depending on dose and equally transformational and equally as uh, meaningful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to enter into uh, a ceremonial context based in a culture that's different than mine because most of the more, more educated and experienced facilitators of ayahuasca, which often needs that facilitator, at least for myself, I would not feel comfortable drinking it you know, by myself um, at this time anyways. Um, they come from a different cultural background, so it's like I'd feel maybe safer. Uh, I'd feel more inclined to want to have a Shipibo-esque ayahuasca experience um, but I don't necessarily feel like I'd want to have a Shipibo-esque mushroom experience, right? I want to have whatever feels most personally meaningful. And um, with mushrooms, which for me are, I'm 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 participating in the building of a culture when I'm taking mushrooms, um, because there wasn't really a very defined one there when I started, and I think. The places that there are still defined mushroom cultures that from from antiquity, um, I don't relate to those places. I'm not Mexican, you know. Like I, I don't I don't align with that. Same with ayahuasca. It's like I'm not from Central or South America. 
I don't believe in jaguar spirits and stuff. It's the, that's that's not my mythology. I can't get into that. So when I build ceremony, I build a ceremony that is personally meaningful and aligns with the sort of mythological foundations for my sense of meaning in the world. Uh, and I I will kind of leave it there because I will also refer you to a video that I just put up on my YouTube, um, which is like 25 minutes specifically exploring what, why, and how I do ceremony with mushrooms, uh, which I think will probably answer a lot of your questions. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, James. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to help share your knowledge with us. I just want to show some appreciation for that. I'm sure there's things you'd rather be doing. Thank you. Uh, coming from a severe chronic pain standpoint, um, I'm constantly on opiates 24 7, will be for the rest of my life. And I didn't know if that would impede on taking mushrooms, or if, if it does, is there something I can do to help prevent that, say fasting, lemon tech, um, something like that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to alleviate pain, um, as well as situational depression that comes from having severe chronic pain, uh, break, you know, breakthrough experience, ego death, things like that. Um, so in your experience, is there any sort of interaction with opiates and psilocybin? Okay, good, great question. Great question. Um, so I'll make a little um, like I'll couch this with the suggestion for you to look into a book called "When the Body Says No." by Gabor Mate, um, which kind of very thoroughly explores and justifies the thesis that um, uh, most chronic illnesses, including depression um, and including anything that is autoimmune, is the very real, very physiological response of trauma earlier in life or at some point. Um, that is, and trauma is something that is, is a subjective experience. Now, I'm not saying that to say that the, everything is, that it's not very real and that it's not an extremely difficult situation to correct because it's like, you know, if, uh, if I spent my whole life being told something, and it's at the very foundation of my identity, you know, I just can't think that away. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not how it works. And so, um, biologically, I think that the experience of mushrooms might be very helpful, possibly because it seems like um, uh, mushrooms have some strong anti-inflammatory impact, um, on the brain at least. And um, also because I, I believe that there's an emotional element to autoimmune conditions, wherein, I mean, not to say like mushrooms will cure you, but to say that you know, it might give you at the very least perspective on how you relate to the pain, which might make the inner subjective experience of the pain less, if that makes any sense. Now, where that influence, and so I can understand why you would want to do that. And I don't think that, I, I also, I wouldn't say that your depression is situational to your pain so much as they're both symptoms of a deeper wounding that is inside of you that is likely sourced in multiple generations of issues which express in genetics and epigenetics and physiological disposition and relationship dynamics and stuff. Um, and so when it comes to opiates, there's no physiological, neurological danger to mixing them. Um, like the, there's cons like even with psychedelics, it's like most of the concerns are psychological. Um, there is some level of concern with microdosing mushrooms and LSD for um, uh, heart conditions, um, and and then there's like the risk of maybe hypertension that could come up when uh, when tripping psychedelics, especially in high doses. But uh, the, even even the issue even of like serotonin syndrome, which is almost a non-issue, is definitely not a is, is definitely a non-issue when it comes to related to opiates. Uh, 
the issue would be whether or not the opiates would prevent you from being present to your experience, to your pain, which might, like, because that's what they're doing. They're preventing you from being present to your pain. Um, and good, because like, I imagine it absolutely fucking sucks to be in pain all the time. I know I, I'm not going to compare myself to you, but relative to what you described to me, I also live with a lot of body pain. And it's, god damn it, it feels good when it's not there, you know? And if I had to deal with it in a way where it was constantly, um, you know, degrading my quality of life, I, I would be lying to say I wouldn't reach for some opiates to help me out. So it can, it can, um, it's blocking you from experiencing that pain. Now, experiencing the pain in a, in a spiritually, psychologically meaningful container might be helpful in some sort of healing process. Again, maybe not to fix the underlying issue, but to provide a sense of perspective and relationship to the pain, which might hopefully alleviate some of the more um, um, psychological or emotional consequences, such as the depression that you're facing. And so there could be a dampening of that. But at the same time, you're still going to experience a relatively psychedelic experience. So even if you're on the opiates and that's like, that's your, that's your normal state. If you take the psychedelics, you're still having a psilocybin experience, which is a deviation from your normal state. Um, so again, oh, I should have prefaced this because you guys are in the United States and stuff, but of course I'm not advocating for the use of any illegal drugs. Um, just like being that clear. Um, and also I'm not a doctor or a therapist. So like this is just the opinions of a writer or a researcher. So. Um, that I actually genuinely mean. Don't make, don't take severe medical decisions uh, based off my opinion alone, please, because um, I might be wrong. Uh, so, yeah. So I think that it could be very helpful. I don't think you have to worry too much physiologically about any interactions, um, but possibly it might be advantageous to try a psilocybin experience after having sort of come off the opiates a little bit, um, although I, I bet it would be very difficult and very uncomfortable. So does that answer your question? Do you feel like that addresses what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, um, for the last three and a half years, I've uh, been getting medical treatments with IV ketamine. Uh, I've yep. been getting weekly IV ketamine infusions, uh, 500 milligrams over three hours. And I've experienced a lot of you know ego death, um, a lot of the things that we've covered um, and I have, you know, everything that you just said, I have experience with ketamine. Um, so it does fit, you know. Um, psilocybin is kind of a weird thing to be in. I mean, I experimented as a kid. Um, coming into it now with an actual therapeutic reason, you know, I just want to make sure that I can get the most out of the experience. You know, that it knows that I'm sort of coming off of it, it's fascinating, or run factor, you know, whatever. But, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I think getting the most out of your experience will really be defined by how you prepare, um, who, and like how you structure it, who you're with, and how you integrate it. Um, I think ketamine is really incredible. Physiologically, it is an immediate, like, it's like emergency medicine for depression. Like right away. I think it's also an emergency medicine in a lot of ways. It's one of the most important emergency medicines that we have in our world right now. Um, and also there's this interesting correlation between ketamine use and the allevi the temporary alleviation of chronic pain syndromes. Um, so definitely there's something there, although I also see ketamine and psilocybin as very different ways to address emotional distress, because I think ketamine makes it go away for a little while, and psilocybin helps you understand it in a way that makes it less, not less, but in a way that um, allows it to be less disruptive to our daily experience. Um, actually, I, I, I think I wrote an article that you can probably find, maybe Jason can link it on the Facebook page, about um, using ketamine to treat depression. It was a while ago, uh, so there's definitely updated science that's not represented there. But I give a discussion about where I see the differences between treatment depression, uh, treatment with uh, of depression with ketamine versus uh, psilocybin, which I think would probably um, be helpful for you. And I just I want to wish you um, whatever you choose to do, like safety 
and um, and um, yeah, and, and an overall good experience and yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. And um, before I go, what was the name of that book again? When the body says no, Gabor Mate, G A B O R M A T E, little apostrophe, Mate. James, thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. And my question involves a lot more. How does one get accepted into the community of the cannabis mushroom community? Because you can meet either a member of the community before, and there are gatekeepers, and there's a sense of paranoia that you're not fully accepted until a particular time frame occurs. For example, when I was at a church, because I was not considered a member, I was not allowed to participate in certain activities like to help clean up the church, to help set up the church for various functions. I was like, I was not accepted into the church community, even we all believe in the same God. So but with this community that you mentioned, can you give us some examples of some ways that we can all be accepted into the community versus going through these paranoid stages and these fear stages by these gatekeepers who try to put us off the side of being a new member, so to speak? Mm-hmm. Well, this is a, this is a great question. Um, really great question because it's it's true, you know, like especially in the active uh, entheogenic, psychedelic plant medicine communities, the reality is that due to what I believe to be, um, well, okay, you guys are in the United States, uh, constitutionally unjust prohibition based in lies and racist rhetoric, um, if they're illegal. Uh, and they're still illegal, and you risk having um, the long arm of the empire's political agenda take your life away, either literally by killing you or, um, or, or figuratively in the sense of your liveliness when they enter your, um, your, you know, your premises with the legal jurisdiction to perhaps murder you or at the very least take all of your things and lock you away for engaging a plant. Um, and I guess more so engaging the, the, the you know, risky ideological consequences of no longer believing in the powers, in, 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 the, in the so-called truths or we'll say alternative facts of the powers that be. So yeah, it's very problematic, and people need to people need to keep that safe. You know, I, I I think about this in regards to the people who supply us, for example. Um, and I'll I'll give the example of uh, Nick Sand. Okay, he's a famous LSD chemist um, from the United States. Uh, him and Tim Scully were uh, the people who were making the original Orange Sunshine. Uh, back in the what 60s, um, and then other guys like Casey Williams Hardison, who was making LSD and also 2CB. These guys went to prison, and when you when you ask them why it was that they did what they did, they did what they did because they believed that this was a powerful medicine for the positive healing and impact and growth of the world, and they risked everything for that. And so these are people who are risking their everything to ensure that we have the medicine, right? And so when we welcome people into that community, we're putting the members of that community who access us to this medicine at risk as well as ourselves. So the unfortunate consequence of all of that is being very selective with who you let in, especially, um, I don't know how bad it is in the United States, or sorry, in Canada, um, but it's it's well recorded that the United States is um, has a particularly sticky track record for surveillance um, and uh, and infiltration and even illegal activities, which later are made legal through um, legislation that uh, disregards your, the very foundations of your freedoms there. So um, yeah, it's, it all makes perfect sense. How do you get accepted? Uh, I don't really know. Just participate to whatever degree you're allowed to participate 
um, and prove your trustworthiness and integrity over time. It's really, I think, that simple. Um, it would be different maybe for someone like myself. I think most people will immediately trust that I'm not a CIA agent because of what I do. Um, if, if that's the case, I mean, if I was, I'd be like a sleeper agent maybe, you know, like they're just waiting to call the code word and I just rat everyone out. Um, or a double agent working on both sides. But either way, it's like, yeah, I, I, I don't, the answer to that is basically just participate to the degree to which you are given permission to. Um, build genuine, beautiful friendships, show your integrity and trustworthiness, and you'll be welcomed in. Yeah, I, I think that's how we, any of us get into community. It just makes it more restrictive when literally lives are at risk um, when welcoming new people into, say, into the know. Right? Does that answer? I can't see you, but maybe throw a hand up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Was it a yes? Was that a yes? I still couldn't see. Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, James. Hello. Uh, I'm Lisa. Um, thanks for your time today. Um, I'm looking at both sides of the use of treatment resistant depression. Um, mm -hmm. Like um, uh, Josh was here, I actually get some infusions uh, for that. And uh, honestly, actually, I have a little experience with psilocybin. And you mentioned something earlier really about microdosing and some comments about that. I was kind of trying to figure out, because I read a little bit about people doing, you know, like a uh, heroic dose versus uh, doing microdosing. I really don't know what the harm of microdosing is and what really would be, I don't know, what's, what's the right way to go I'm just trying to learn and figure this out. Yeah, uh, that's that's like what's the right way to go about it is ultimately um, to try and try, I guess, try to find someone who has experience in helping people relieve, relieve and say heal depression, which is to say to resolve the underlying psychological, emotional traumas that lead to the to the um, mind body disposition, which we describe uh, and 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 group the symptomology of into what we call depression right so i don't know if that was a little bit convoluted but um as for micro dosing the danger that it was discussed and this has been sort of like discussed in the more like astute culture around micro dosing and psychedelics for a while and it's getting a little bit more recognition recently the hefner institute just posted uh, an article about it is that um especially with lsd that has a very long duration that um, overactivation of a particular serotonin subreceptor, the 5-HT2A or 2C or maybe 2B, I don't remember. One of them is associated with this condition where you sort of like grow tissue in your heart where the tissue is not supposed to be and can cause serious issues. And other serotonergic drugs um, that focused on that particular subreceptor have been taken off the market because of causing this issue. Whether or not that's actually going to be an issue with microdosing, we don't know yet because, again, same reason why we don't get led into the community um, is uh, is <laughs> we're not allowed to fucking research it. Um, so we're not allowed to like actually have people taking these things and to do the science. Um, I think we're in a real problematic place when we say like, oh, you can't do this thing that is actually relatively safe by all statistics um, in science because we said so. Uh, yeah, so how to go about with depression. Um, I don't think, I think microdosing can help to lessen and alleviate symptoms, right? Um, and I think that they work similar to taking antidepressant drugs. And you know that I might get some flack from microdosing proponents on that. Um, but they, they lessen the symptoms, now, held in the right context, just like antidepressant drugs, with the right therapeutic support, the lessening of the symptoms plus therapeutic process can help actually start fixing whatever's underneath the depression um, or bringing it back to a state of um, to a state of health. Yeah, uh, and then a but it takes sort of like a lot of time. Now, a mega dose could get there too. But again, it takes a lot of time and integration, and it really requires being in a safe container to do that and having someone to support you psychologically, socially, therapeutically, 
onto, in, and out from that experience, which can be very difficult, again, when our, when the, when the development of psilocybin therapy has been hampered for so long, and the people who are offering it are offering it from a place of, um, of having to hide that they're doing it to protect their life and their livelihood. So it is quite difficult. Um, I, there's no, there's really no, there's really no answer to that. I know that for myself, um, when I'm feeling depressed, psilocybin really helps and it kind of helps me get an understanding of why it is that I was depressed rather than just making my symptoms go away. Um, it has been very, very therapeutic for me. However, I only saw profound therapeutic potential when I started engaging it um, inside of the sort of larger paradigm for trauma that I've been talking about throughout the course of today, which is encapsulated very well by the work of people like um, Devin Christie and Gabor Mate and Peter Levine and Alice Miller. Uh, these are people that represent that paradigm very well. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I, like, I wanted to give a really good answer to that, but it's like, thing is, is that there isn't really an answer for it. It's all just a bunch of nuances and complexities, but I really hope that you find what you're looking for. And I promise you that like healing is there and you are 100% capable of getting there. It just might continue to be complex and bewildering for a little while first. Uh, I think I can maybe take one more question. Um, I'm feeling cognitively like I'm fading and I want to be able to like not give you poor answers. Um, and also I got to pee. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay um, I just had one question. It's been on my mind lately. Um, I posted it in the Facebook group just a few days ago. And as I've experienced psychedelics over the last um, few years or so, I've found that there's no kind of bounds to what to explore. And it seems the deeper I seem to go, the more I seem to uncover, obviously. Um, and the integration of those, you mentioned like the, you mentioned the megadose versus the microdose. Um, the microdose thing obviously is much easier to integrate. There's these little epiphanies maybe you get through the day, but if you're talking about these flood doses of, you know, multigrams, um, or many hits of acid or however you want to go deep. Uh, for me, it's been psilocybin. So these things that I'm understanding about myself, um, but let me pose it this way, I guess. Uh, John Lilly, he said, uh, try and stay in the center of the cycle. Right? So with integration and trying to self-actualize and live a life true to yourself, how do you how do you prevent becoming a cyclone? Like you're always in the middle of that. I understand to stay stay centered, but the actions that you're putting in place to make changes in your life to, to make you feel self actualized. How do you how do you eliminate or is it possible even to eliminate the storm at the edges and kind of destroying relationships and um, customs? you're accustomed to or different morals or, or things like that hmm. yeah great question um if you want to just kill your mic so that i'm not distracted you can answer it well um i think john c Lilly was very intelligent and a very interesting contributor i also would like to point out for a good portion of his sort of professional and public uh, career he was a ketamine addict um so his models might, depending on what time frame you're getting them from, might not necessarily be the, the best perspective um, on navigating life. Uh, but I hear what you're saying, and definitely I, I want to maybe say that everything that I talked to you about with psilocybin today, this is like a window into a potential, and it's just like vast, untapped, multi-potential spaces. This is just one expression of working with the mushrooms, and one you know, set of intention that's geared towards, we'll just say, healing in general um, and psycho-spiritual maturity. There's other ones that are just, for example, Kalindi E. Yee, and uh, his work with it is 
just about how deep can you go in exploring the multiverse, to, to quote him. And, uh, you know, other people, uh, they're more into a shamanic approach about interacting with the plant spirits and those entities and maintaining sort of like um, lifestyles and cultures around prayer, around ceremony um, for the benefit of the larger mass rather than necessarily the personal therapeutic benefit uh, of the person and living a good life. So there's a lot of potential there. So insofar as being in the center of the cyclone, I mean, like the easy answer to that is just like practice, you know, do about 15 to 20 minutes of mindfulness meditation every day. You should be able to like stay close to the center at least. Um, but the more difficult question of that is like, of course, we want to be in healthy relationships. We want to feel healthy. We want to feel courageous, present and free. You know, we want to feel like, um, like everything is good. We want to feel comfortable with the way things are, but the reality is that life isn't comfortable and the way things are is not easy and the way things are, are is not the center of the cyclone. And the very meaning of our lives, and to quote or to paraphrase one of um, one of my favorite elders, you know, the, the crucible of life's meaning is in how we wrestle with the way things are. And I don't know if there's an answer to getting into that perfect balanced place while still participating in the messy world of North America and the messy world of the urban environments. You know, if, if that's, there's lots of different tips. It's like, Oh, did you want to have healthier relationships? Well, you know, taking courses on attachment theory, maybe doing, you know, somatic experiencing therapy, uh, for or, or relational somatic therapy to, to reset your nervous system's response to safety inside relationship or possibly practicing nonviolent communication. There's lots of techniques to get certain things. It's like if um, if you want to feel happier, then maybe you know uh, doing laughter yoga. If you want to feel um, more you know alive and capable, you know physical training, some sort of complex physical training. So it's like different paths to achieve different things. But insofar as life as a whole, I think like the real center of the cyclone is not necessarily being detached from that which is and the way things are so much as it's about just ongoingly staying committed to yourself as a process through time um, deriving the very meaning of your life in the wrestling match <laughs> with the way things are um, which is different from fighting because when you fight you win or you lose and with life eventually you lose because you die if you fight it uh, where wrestling you can get pinned at the end and still win for style so um I guess that I don't know if that directly answers your question, Jason, but uh, that's what's coming up for me. I guess what the 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 main part of it kind of was how to man, it's hard to conceptualize, I guess, but how to refrain from damaging um, relationships in the process of changing your life. I guess is there a way to well, that really depends, Jason, because perhaps the relationships that you're in are an extension of the damage. And as you unfold and correct that damage, those relationships can't stay. Possibly, you know, as you heal, what you realize is that you can't continue to participate in sick things while you heal. And maybe the relationship was sick to begin with. Or maybe other people aren't interested in going along on your journey. You know, it's terrible metaphor, but sometimes a few eggs need to be broken um, to make an omelet. And if what you're doing is trying to let go of that which held you back in the past to move forward into a, 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 a future, which is to say a present moment of greater freedom, of greater capacity of being your authentic self, um, then it's entirely possible that part of that process will be grieving and it might be grieving um, the loss of relationships that were dear to you at that time, but no longer serve you now. Um, and it's, I mean, we got to be careful about, you know, the, the projection of blame, you know, I, I dance contact improv and one of my favorite teachers makes a comment. He said, by the third day, that train, that train of, I don't like this is going to come and it's going to look like your dance partner sucks. But the reality is that you're just feeling inadequate, but you're not, and you just got to keep dancing, basically. And so there's a fear of of blaming others, for sure. Um, 
but yeah, there's just like, there's really no clear answer to that, Jason. It's, it's all so contextual, right? But yeah, it's possible that certain relationships won't stick around and that's going to suck and possibly actually letting them go later in life is what enables you to go back into them. Or maybe it's the thing that having totally decimated it um, and having sent on a healing journey is what sets you up for, you know, what looks like what actually works better for you and another person later in the future. I mean, there's really no clear path on this one, man. Just keep your machete ready for when those vines get in the way. I mean, that's kind of an aggressive metaphor. I don't hold on to that one. That was just for fun. All right. No, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, so it looks like we're kind of running out of some time here, but um, I just wanted to thank you, James, for you know, taking part out of your day, for sharing your uh, knowledge and wisdom with the group here. Uh, I encourage all of you guys to check out his book. Um, if any of it resonated with you, um, he goes into a lot of detail in the book. And he was writing in the podcast and things like that. There you go. Yeah, and also, um, Jason, I'd like to thank you for having me and also... Uh, your psychedelic society, this whole community that came out. Thank you for honoring me with your time and your attention. Um, I understand that this was a donation based event. Is that correct? Yeah, the, my podcast sponsored this. So. Okay, I was going to say that. The club is another podcast. James was a guest last year, and um, it's really the last kind of year and a half that's been highly kind of psychedelically charged, go figure. But uh, so this will be available on podcast as well. I'll have the recording up. Great, great. Yeah, I was just going to say that J Jason paid me to honor my time and skills. So if you have the capacity to donate into the fund for more events like this to happen uh, with other speakers, I would encourage you to uh, honor that capacity as best you can. Yes, we do okay. take donations. Thank you, James. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, also please check out, please check out my podcast. Um, speaking of donations, I'm entirely fan funded for the most part. These events are fantastic. They're a contributor as well. Uh, although most of my living is made in the opt in voluntary model of people believing in what I'm doing, um, and throwing me a couple dollars each month to keep doing it. So go enjoy my content. And if at some point you want to give me some money for it, I'm totally into that too. All right. Um, I think that's about it. Well, James, enjoy the rest of the day. And, uh... Thanks. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Okay, there you have it. Thanks for tuning in today. Just real quick, for a little bit more information about everything you've had today, it's jameswgesso.com intellectualgentlemensclub.com and for the Michigan Psychedelic Society you can just find it right through Facebook the intro track you heard is from the American Dollar it's called Time and the exit track is called Part of Life from Nanobite till the next time guys hang loose out there
Stickers.